Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies and the Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to ending corporate domination and creating a just society based on an actable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Julia DeGraw, Northwest Senior Organizer for Food and Water Watch. Food and Water Watch fights to protect our food and water from harm by big ag, big gas and oil, and big water through grassroots organizing and advocacy. So I'm glad to have Julia back here on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, it's been been uh, a few years, I would guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so well, I would guess that the last time you were on, we were talking about Nestle mm -hmm. and and the various uh, attempts by Nestle to uh, force water into bottles. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we want to talk about that also. Uh, but, but I did want to ask, talk a little bit about uh, Food and Water Watch, what you do and why you do it. Sure. Um, so I'm the Northwest organizer, as you mentioned, with Food and Water Watch. And uh, as an organization, we're committed to, uh, at this point in time, it's really about fixing our broken democracy, right? We have a system that works very well for corporations. Uh, corporations have done an incredible job of taking over the political process in a lot of ways uh, to make uh, policies that benefit corporations but don't help people or farmers or you know consumers, people who have to exist in this society. Um, and trust that the food they're buying in supermarkets is, is safe. Our farmers who are trying to make a living uh, growing our food are really held hostage by you know, large corporations like Monsanto and Cargill and, and Big Ag uh, corporations. So Food and Water Watch is really working on trying to uh, shift toward uh, doing a lot more work, frankly, at the, the political level too. We have um, Food and Water Action now. Uh, which is our uh, C4 um, arm of the organization, which means that we're actually going to be doing more political work. Mm. Uh, we really recognize, especially in a Trump era, that we need uh, massive shifts at the local and regional level if we're going to ever stand a chance at taking back Congress and making it work for people again. So we're really um, putting our money where our mouth is on that mm -hmm. um, and identifying how we can make major shifts at the, the regional and local level toward uh, having these ma bigger shifts at the national level. Um, and all that said, uh, it means that we're doing um, a lot of work to support public water infrastructure. We are still pushing for uh, the Water Act at the federal level and, and shaming members of Congress for not acting on it if they're not and trying to keep that, that momentum alive to fund our public water systems. Um, and we are also uh, doing a lot of work uh, at the regional level to make sure that we are uh, promoting a clean energy future. So we, we just recently launched a, a new campaign um, called off fossil fuels, because we need to transition to a just uh, uh, clean energy future. Um, and we're clearly not gonna do this at the federal level, mm -hmm. and so we are really uh, joining the, the mass movement across this country to push for 100% renewable by 2035. We believe it has to happen by 2035 to ensure that we can really avoid catastrophic runaway climate change. Yeah, so that's only 15 years or thereabouts. I'm not real good at the adding. But yeah, no, it's, right? a, it's, it's yeah. a heavy lift. It's a heavy yeah. lift, mm -hmm. but if we don't do this hard organizing um, and, and, and difficult, if like, we don't do this work now at making this huge shift, um, then, then we're really rolling the dice. You know, it's a 50-50 chance, you know, if we manage to get this under control by 2050 um, as to whether or not we'll actually be able to avoid unmitigated climate change. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think that what we fail to remember sometimes, and even elected officials who are for renewable energy will sometimes say things like, you know, we don't have the technology yet, we're out to figure it out as we go. And it's like the bottom line is, we have the technology and the ability right now uh, to conserve enough energy and go to renewables. Um, it's really a matter of, of political will. And mm -hmm. we need to shift the political will at the regional, at the local, regional, and state level really quickly if we're going to be able to pull this off. And I have to say, you know, we I just read this article the other day where over 7,000 mayors from across the, the world gathered to support the Paris Climate Accords. Mm -hmm. You know, we it's like uh, there's, there's a, a, a realization globally happening right now about the realization that we need to be acting at the regional and local level because our, our national governments aren't necessarily going to step up to the plate in the right no, way. Particularly our national government. Well, governments. especially our national government, <laughs> clearly, <laughs> yes. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and I think both Portland and Multnomah County recently set a goal 
Um, and it was 100% renewable energy by... It was 100% renewable energy by 2050, mm -hmm. but there was a subset goal in there that they would be providing all energy to consumers uh, uh, that in, a, in a green, renewable way by 2035. Oh, okay. um, so that actually does meet the Food and Water Watch goal of 100% of renewable by, mm -hmm. by 2035. Um, and then they, uh, they give themselves till 2050 to transition um, transportation and other sources oh, of energy, okay. which is obviously a really heavy lift as well. Yeah, so, uh, right. um, yeah. And I think that what, what's going to well, happen you, is... You know, my, my feeling always mm -hmm. is, you know, sometimes goals seem unrealistic when you set them, mm -hmm. but it's the same thing as political leaders deciding that they're not going to ask for what's needed. Mm -hmm. They ask for what or demand what they think they can get, mm -hmm. and so we're always sold short yeah. as a result. So, you know, setting some of these goals that seem unrealistic mm -hmm. is absolutely what we need to do in order in order to even think about uh, surviving. This is why I work at, at an organization like Food and Water Watch is, is uh, we were the, one of the first national, we were the first national organization to call for a ban on fracking. And there was a lot of groups that were working for regulation because they felt that a ban wasn't possible. Um, and we live in a world now in which Maryland has banned fracking. A Republican governor and a Republican-led Senate, our state legislature, you know, signed into law a ban on fracking. Mm -hmm. And in Florida, major headway was made in a Republican-led legislature toward banning fracking as well. And I think in New York, we won, right, mm -hmm. as well. And I think, um, and, and there's a large, broad national movement to call for a ban on fracking. It really shifted the conversation. Um, and, and there are certain issues in which there is not a compromised position that is adequate, you yeah. know, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and fracking is one of them. And climate change is another, you know, the, the runaway climate change uh, would affect our ability to continue to exist as human civilization as we know it. And, mm -hmm. and, and to, to settle for politically viable over what is necessary is not adequate to the task. So, yeah. um, and we just need to prove, uh, I, I, think, I think we Americans are just now starting to realize that the people actually can be and are more powerful than corporations. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, yeah. And so did Food and Water Watch work with Multnomah County and uh, the city of Portland to get this ordinance uh, passed? We actually uh, were developing our energy policy or, uh, as that was happening. Oh, so oh. we were not um, instrumental in that. I showed up, I mean, we did near the end of that process encourage people to come and testify. We wanted to make sure that um, that biofuels, uh, the, this idea of uh, you know cutting trees to create clean energy would not be part of the, the plan. And, uh, and so we, we were involved in the, at the end of the process in making sure that we got the strongest, best resolution we could get. Um, and I'm hoping to be part of the, the coalition efforts, you know, and community-led efforts to hold the city to the deal that they've made to the mm -hmm. people, right? You know, mm -hmm. now we have a plan, that's great, but that's the easy part. Now we have to get around to implementing well, exactly it and actually it. making it right. happen. So right. we're hoping to, to be part of that process. Yeah, but that is very exciting, you know, that you said, was it 7,000 mayors mm -hmm. uh, from around the world had had established this as, as a goal? Uh, that, that's very exciting. It is. To think that's just that people are, are, are and, you know, important people are, are, are beginning to take action. And mayors represent constituencies, you know, mm -hmm. in a way that unfortunately members of Congress at this point don't, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, mayors represent, a, a, are a better representation of people power at this point mm -hmm. than, than our federal, federally elected officials. And so um, to me, what that shows me, you know, as an organizer is that, 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 that the era of real power of people is, is starting to rise, you know, because mm -hmm. the mayors are starting to realize like, oh my gosh, you know, we cannot, obviously we need to be doing taking action on our level if we want to actually solve these very large problems that we're facing, because we can't wait for leadership to come from above. Uh, yeah, because it's, it, at this point, any leadership from the above is going to be regressive, not, yeah. not At least in, in America, for sure. In, 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 others, America, in, in yeah. other countries, it might be inadequate to the task as mm -hmm. well, or slow. Mm -hmm. So I, mean, I think people are just realizing that at the regional and local level, we're going to have to really take this on ourselves, yeah. um, which is exciting. It's, it's, it's a really, it's an amazing time to be doing this work. Right. And I feel like Nestle is also a really good example yes. of, of, of how locally we, we have been able to build an immense amount of p power um, in small rural communities to keep a mega multinational corporation out of this region, which mm -hmm. is pretty exciting. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so, so uh, thank you for I just realized I was transitioning to the thing, yeah, but yeah, like, yeah. I mean, I could, <laughs> we, we can talk about all the work we're doing. I'm excited to talk about it. I'm really, 
uh, I think it's important to be able to touch on the, the energy work because the mm -hmm. bottom line is uh, all of the you know work that people generally view as traditionally food and water watch work you know working on and, and, we don't, and we're still involved in mm -hmm. in our, our traditional work but the bottom line is uh, we cannot afford to to not solve the climate change crisis yeah, yeah. you know any of the work that we do is, is just you know there's if we can't get climate change right then we're just arranging, you know, chairs on the Titanic, you know. Right. So, uh -huh. so that's really what it what it comes down to is mm -hmm. is is we're recognizing that that all the work that everyone does is really ultimately going to be contingent on whether or not we can uh, avoid catastrophic runaway climate change. Yeah. Um, at the state level, here in Oregon, what has Food and Water Watch been focused on uh, other than Nestle? So, other than Nestle, uh, I mean, over the years we were involved in. Um, uh, the fight to label GMOs. I think people mm -hmm. probably remember that. Um, I got within 816 votes. Uh, pretty, pretty agonizing on that front. Um, it was a statewide ballot measure. Um, he, uh, what we're focusing on uh, currently is transitioning um, to a lot more to this off fossil fuels campaign, which is uh, encouraging uh, people to ask uh, their uh, elected officials at the city level and even at the state level to sign uh, an off fossil fuels pledge that okay. is uh, making a, co a commitment to uh, transitioning off fossil fuels uh, as quickly as possible and in a way that is equitable and, and, and fair and, and sustainable. Um, and that's going to help us identify climate champions, right? You know, and and in communities uh, or in cities where we have a large amount of support, we'll be able to hopefully push for resolutions similar to what Multnomah County and Portland just passed, mm -hmm. right? So, so throughout the Northwest, I, mean, I feel like Seattle, which is following Portland's footsteps and going, uh, they just oh. passed a resolution saying that they will have no new fossil fuel infrastructure, um, uh, and we think uh, hopefully the next step will be to go 100% renewable by 2035. Um, mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, there will be a lot of opportunities throughout the region to, to be uh, working toward these resolutions um, at the city level. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, longer term, this gives us an opportunity to identify where we might even be able to support, um, you know, running candidates, you know, because we have the C4, the mm -hmm. Food and Water Watch action now, where we can identify where we think we can strategically run um, climate champions uh, and really shift the, the electorate. That's that's down the line, mm -hmm. right? That's not something we can do immediately, but it's something that, um, that, that we think, you know, the, the Off Fossil Fuels campaign will help us figure out where those, those districts are. Uh -huh. um, and the other uh, work that we're doing is uh, th there's, this is a, I don't know if you've had anybody, if you've spoken to anybody about this issue yet, but um, Oregon is home to the largest dairy in the country. Um, Three yeah. Mile Canyon uh, uh, yes. farms. Uh, farms. It's a cute name for a massive uh, mega dairy. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you're bringing this up because mm -hmm. actually it is a topic that I have wanted to, and I have identified someone to come on and spend a half hour on it. Uh, but go ahead and talk about it because this is one of those things that is totally under the radar, mm -hmm. uh, but it has huge consequences on on a lot of levels. So mm -hmm. go, go ahead and talk about Three Mile. So yeah, what we're really concerned about is that Three Mile, uh, Three Mile Farms is uh, is in Morrill County, uh, and it's it's in a groundwater management area, which means that it's an area that has been struggling with its groundwater supply and contamination. So it's it, they have a groundwater supply that is uh, that's unstable, um, and and the the state has been trying to. Um, to, to fix it for a while and for decades, frankly, um, but it still is struggling. So we have a groundwater area that's that's struggling, and we have a massive mega dairy that's creating millions of gallons of of waste, manure waste, and, and other kinds of waste um, that is the equivalent of any major city in Oregon, mm -hmm. and without any sewage treatment facility. They just have massive lagoons that hold this, mm -hmm. uh, this manure. Um, and then that manure is often uh, used uh, as fertilizer on fields around the area. And if you over apply it, then that fertilizer can end up getting into the, the groundwater, which is the fear. Um, and, uh, and basically the moral of the story is there's just literally a lot of waste that is not being adequately treated. Um, and there's a lot of risk associated with that waste. It, there's no, it doesn't mean necessarily that the waste has gotten into the groundwater yet, but there's a huge threat 
that it potentially could. Um, and, and it's a very dry part of the state. And uh, the numbers really vary on this, uh, depending on which stat statistics you look at. But in a dairy farm, each head of cattle tends to drink about 60 gallons of water per day. That's the lower end that I've read. Mm -hmm. um, and we're talking about 70,000 head of cattle in one location. That is a lot of water. That's a huge in amount a, of water. In, in a very dry part of the state. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, so are they taking the water out of the Columbia River? or where, where It's they get, a groundwater. Or, or it's from the ground. Right. Okay. So yeah. this is in, in a right. groundwater management area, which mm -hmm. is like problematic, you can imagine. And so uh, what we're concerned about is, I mean, that farm currently exists. It's, it's it, you know, it exists under current regulation in Oregon. Um, the concern is uh, there's a proposal for another mega dairy to come in basically right next door, mm -hmm. um, that would bring an additional 30,000 head of cattle to start, um, which would mean 100,000 head of cattle um, in this groundwater management area in Morrow County that is very dry. Um, so we're gonna add, so there's this huge concern that um, the Oregon will very quickly become the mega dairy capital of the world. Um, and yeah. that, and, 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 and no one will know about it. And, and <laughs> people won't know about it, and, and there will be inadequate regulation uh, to protect the the resources and public health and and so something that um, technically there actually is groundwater laws they need to be following um, so there's a lot of monitoring going on around the, the groundwater but there's they, they, they're exempted from air quality regulations oh. and they're in the Columbia River Gorge um, and there are haze issues and other pollutant issues and this is frankly one of the largest point sources of ammonia pollution in in the state if not the largest state of ammonia pollution, mm -hmm. uh, a, a largest uh, uh, point source of, of ammonia pollution. So there's like major concern about air quality pollution that, that comes off of um, these mega dairies and there's no regulation for it. So that was something that um, a coalition of groups that Food and Water Watch has been involved with, um, including Columbia, Columbia Riverkeeper and uh, Friends of Family Farmers and others. Um, to try to pass air quality regulation at the fed at the state level, mm -hmm. um, which unfortunately didn't make its way out of committee, um, okay. frustratingly so. And it was literally following the guidelines of the Dairy Air Quality Task Force from 2008 that had industry leaders and stakeholders um, all bought in to this uh, regulatory solution on how to meet air quality standards. And those exact same people and, and, and companies that had been involved in making those recommendations fought this regulation tooth and nail. So, so, so uh, I'm understanding you to say that they essentially wrote it in the first place and then they fought yeah. to not have it implemented. They fought to not have it actually right. implemented. Um, right. And granted, right, that was 2008 when it happened and maybe they were happy to sign uh, a non-binding, um, mm -hmm. you know, ad, you know, advice, uh, advice to what the state should do or could mm -hmm. do to, to address air quality. But when push came to shove, when it came actual time to, to, to create the regulations, um, they said that it would hurt uh, family farmers and you know all the things that, uh, that yes, the opposition right. says. But mm -hmm. the bottom line is is that um, uh, there is a dairy air quality bill um, that that didn't make it through this legislative session, but will hopefully still be um, something we can work on moving forward. I mean, the goal is to continue pushing for air quality regulations because um, it's, it's, it's frankly unacceptable that, that massive, dairy, uh, massive dairy operations are exempted from air quality laws. Mm -hmm. that's, that's just, un and there's also this other massive concern about um, the fact that mega dairies actually um, put family farmers out of business. There's there's very good data on uh, the precipitous decline in, in, in smaller farms as, uh, within the, you know three and five years after uh, Three Mile Canyon opened up operations. Right, and, and then there's the whole question about how the animals themselves are treated. Yeah, the animal welfare question is, is undoubtedly, yeah. I mean, there's you, you, it's not possible to humanely house that many animals in one location. Mm -hmm. um, and something that is, is really fascinating too is that it, this, this very much this this dairy um, provides milk to Tillamook uh, I was so to make shocked. cheese it's so disappointing at their when cheese I factory yeah. on 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 and and it's 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 you know so they could get cheese in Walmart you know they have a, they have a larger market and the reason why they're looking to expand even more is because um, the Asian markets are really looking to have more um, powdered milk and and so we're talking about just massively producing 
um, dairy products for um, for export mm -hmm. um, in in one of the driest uh, parts of the state with air quality issues yeah. and and groundwater issues. It's yeah. it's it's just not a very smart. So the other thing that's going on, and and, and you can uh, to track on that issue is is there's a there's a bunch of legal. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of different ways to try to fight uh, the expansion of mega dairies in the state of Oregon, and, and, and we're exploring, the, the coalition of groups is exploring all of them. And, and I think part of what needs to happen is people need to be calling the governor and calling their state legislators and making it really clear that, mm -hmm. that it's not, that it's not, that it's, that, that um, we are not open for business to, to more mega dairies. You know, yeah. that this is not a politically. Yeah, not, not only should yeah. we not have more, but we should be thinking about how do we close down yeah, the and we should we certainly stop. Yeah, stop the expansion and then figure out a way to better regulate what already exists. Oh, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Are there are there other mega dairies in Oregon? Um, no, I mean the largest is Three Mile. I, I don't have all the stats on on um, uh, how many large like uh, uh, operations we have in the state, mm -hmm. um, but generally um, the more that farmers have to compete with a mega dairy, it forces farmers to 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 go big or go home. So, so, so a lot of the mid-sized um, dairies really, you know, went under after after Three Mile opened up shop. And uh, I mean, there's some organic dairies, uh, you know, that, that because they're doing a kind of a more specialty, um, uh, you know, product that 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 are kind of exist in a separate area, yeah. you know, of, of the market. But for the most part, if you're trying to be a traditional dairy, it's very hard to compete. Um, against in an environment where you have a mega dairy producing so much product in, in, yeah. in, from one location. Okay, all right. Um, three minutes. What 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 else? What else is Food and Water Watch what working else are we on? Working on? <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, I mean, the, the, and we're continuing to hold the ground on our um, victories against Nestle. Uh, you know, keeping Nestle out of the gorge is is definitely a priority. We want to make sure that. Um, uh, that we defend every victory we have every step of the way, um, making sure that Nestle ultimately doesn't get to open up shop in Cascade Locks, Oregon, where they've been trying to, um, where they've been at it for coming on nine years now, yeah. and um, and uh, and continuing to make sure that as Nestle uh, approaches other communities, whether in the Gorge or throughout the Northwest, that, that those communities have the resources they need to stand up for themselves okay. and, and stop right. Nestle. Great. Yeah, and, and we'll, we'll have you on next week and we'll talk more in detail about Nestle. Uh, talk a little bit more about the GMO initiative mm -hmm. uh, and what happened with that and if there's any plans on moving forward again on it. No, well, the, we, the DARK Act um, passed. So Congress, after uh, soon after um, that ballot measure, within a year of that ballot measure, um, barely failing, which it only failed because the industry did a very, very good job of convincing voters that it might cause their their grocery bills to go up. They didn't oh. change public opinion. Nobody nobody decided labeling was a bad idea. Mm -hmm. uh, they just uh, th there was the the opposition spent so much money on ads and mailers and. Um, bombarding voters that they created doubt. And I think it's also really interesting, um, uh, the Secretary of State threw out, you know, thousands and thousands of ballots because of signatures not matching. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, we were, we did a Herculean effort to get as many of those counted as possible. It, it, it seemed apparent from the trend that if all of those uncounted ballots had been counted, we would have overcome that 816 gap that we lost by. But regardless, um, the federal government managed to pass a law that preempts the state's ability to label genetically engineered foods. Oh, and that's the Dark Act. That's the Dark Act. And that was what the opponents of the act called it. But what was it actually called? Do you remember? This is terrible. I didn't. I, I didn't. I can't remember what it was called. That, I can't fine. remember. Yeah, but but I mean, it, what had happened is it was what was so nefarious about it was um, they the Dark Act itself got um, was basically scrapped. But they they went with. A, a new bill that 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 ostensibly was about labeling, oh. but what they what it what it did was it made QR codes, which are oh. these little codes that mm -hmm. like you have to have a smartphone to look at, mm -hmm. um, optional QR codes, on oh, on yeah, on, right. on food was yeah. what we got, which is another way of saying the dark act. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, making, so, right. making and it, what it did ultimately was it was it and it preempted states from being they wanted to have a consistent po a consistent policy across the board mm -hmm. so there wouldn't be confusing labeling, confusing you, you know, across and the so board, across the nation. Across right, the nation. Right. So I mean the best we could get was voluntary QR codes. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. But a company could 
label if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And some okay. companies, Campbell's, Campbell's Soups. Yeah, yes, and I, I thought I had seen some labels. Yeah, no, the, the, the interesting thing, I mean, this is like true with climate change too, like in insurance companies and the United States military treat climate change as real because it, it's real and it's going to affect their bottom line. Mm -hmm. You know, and the same thing is true of food companies. They recognize that consumers uh, appreciate this information and, 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 and started giving you know them what they wanted regardless of whether or not Congress was acting. So I mean I think that there is um, there was a little bit of response to consumer demand mm -hmm. on that. Front. Right, yeah. Julia, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Okay, we'll see you again next week. Sounds good. All right, great. Okay, we've been talking with Julia DeGraw, Northwest Senior Organizer with Food and Water Watch. Uh, one, of, one of her major campaigns was against uh, Nestle's efforts to bottle water in Cascade Locks and elsewhere throughout the Pacific Northwest. If you'd like to be involved, please contact Julia uh, at uh, gdegraw at fwwatch.org. The Trump administration has notified Congress that they want to renegotiate NAFTA, the North America Free Trade Agreement. Based on the notification, talks with Mexico and Canada can begin in mid-August. Uh, you likely won't hear much about this, but be aware, it will happen, and it will happen fast. While Trump had said during the campaign that he wanted to withdraw the United States from the agreement, now he says he wants to rework it. His Secretary of the Treasury uh, has suggested that the agreement just needs to be upgraded by including provisions from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Yeah, that same agreement that Trump essentially has already vetoed. The Alliance for Democracy will oppose any such upgraded agreement. Any new agreement must meet four criteria, including the elimination of the investor state dispute settlement provisions, which allow multinational corporations to channel to ch challenge nations who change their laws or regulations to protect the health, welfare, and safety of their citizens. Now is a good time to take action. Alliance for Democracy has a postcard available on their website. Please go to afd-pdx.org to print the card and then mail it to your two U.S. Senators and your U.S. Representative to let them know what a renegotiated NAFTA should contain. Thank you for watching. Let's keep working for a people's future, not a corporate future. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.